This meeting right. is being recorded. All right, welcome to our Thursday night New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for today, uh, December 8th. Sad day in uh, history for a lot of us as uh, today John Lennon was uh, killed in New York City. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was Pearl Harbor Day. So anybody who have relatives, we send our uh, condolences for that as well. Tonight, uh, I am proud to present, we are proud to present David King. Dave wrote a great book on Ross Young's In Search of a San Antonio Baseball Legend. You know, we all know the names of Carl Hubble and, and, and uh, McGraw. Ross Young's was one of the uh, Hall of Fame giants from the earlier times, and it's imperative that we learn about these guys if we don't know uh, as well. Uh, my apologies for last weekend, uh, last Thursday. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, a Zoom on Dusty Rhodes, but Jeffrey Rhodes con uh, contracted COVID. Oh. And, uh, you know, he, he mentioned his sister going on by herself, and uh, it was supposed to be a tag team. So we rescheduled that. It'll probably be uh, sometime in March. Next week, uh, we have Steve Kahn. Steve wrote a brand spanking new book out on uh, Sid Gordon. So it would make a good holiday gift. Uh, it is available now on Kindle and the paperback will be available the first week in January. After that, we will have our Christmas Hanukkah week off. And then right before New Year's, for anybody who wants to join me, we'll have a Giants rap session, bitch fest, whatever it is you want to call it, because I know a lot of you guys are not thrilled with what's going on. Um, if any of you, oh, one other thing, uh, I also got a notification that uh, Karen Marco, uh, who just completed a book on Eddie Grant, called Eddie Grant and the Big War, uh, that should be coming out shortly and we'll get her on in March also. During that last week in December, I will be sending out uh, a new uh, Polo Grounder magazine. I'll try to do three uh, during the year, and this will be the third one. And lastly, if anybody's interested, um, I belong to the Baseball Hall of Fame. I'm a, you know, not a, I'm not inducted, but I'm a member. And I got <laughs> notification that uh, there is a Zoom with the uh, president of the Hall of Fame on Monday. And if any of you are interested and not a member, I'd be happy to send you my link. And you could, I, I checked out the link. It didn't look like you had to put any, uh, you know, your uh, Cooperstown Hall of Fame member ID number or anything. So they wouldn't know if you were a member or not. Um, Jim Gates is here, the past librarian, and I'm sure he'll be quiet about that. So Jim, welcome aboard. I haven't seen you in a while. Hope you're well. Uh, without Thank further, you. It's good to be back. Good to see you, Jim. I hope you're well down in Florida. Uh, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to present uh, David King and his story on Ross Young's. David, welcome to the New York Giants Preservation Society. Thank you so much for joining us. The Thank floor you. is yours, Dave. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it, it's it's funny if you, if you read the book, the introduction of the book, I, I talk about how it took me longer to write the book than it did Ross Young's career. Because it took me more, it took me more than 10 years to finally get it from, from, from the idea, the very idea all the way to published. Let's, let's just say, you know, I did a lot of research through the years, found a lot of really interesting stuff, and it never really came together until I finally realized that this was a search. This was just like a, you know, it was a treasure hunt search because Somebody who's been dead since 1927, honestly, it's hard to find anything about them out there anymore. You know, the stadiums were gone. I, well, the, uh, the stadiums were gone. The, you know, the people, of course, were gone. Very few relatives left. Why are you barking at me? Come here. Come here. I think the dog's got to go out. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Dog, yeah, that is, is very, there's some wife beating going a, on. <laughs> he, is, he is a half Labrador, half German Shepherd, Why? and he's a puppy. 
He has lots of energy. And he's also a big, he's a big baby too. Well, anyway, it did, you know, the story originated, the, guy, the idea for the story originated with a colleague of mine at the San Antonio Express News newspaper where I worked for 15 years, the last 15 years of my newspaper. And he said, you know, there's a guy from San Antonio in the Hall of Fame that nobody knows anything about. I says, oh yeah? Because I always, you know, I was always a big history guy from way back. His name was Ross Youngs. Look him up. Well, and I started looking him up. Didn't find a whole lot. I said, well, this would be an interesting series. I used to, one of my main jobs at the Express News was to write sort of series and long-term projects. And it turned into a three-part series. The research I did was a three-part series. And I said, oh, you know, I ought to continue doing this and just turn it into a book. And so, you know, 10 years later, finally, there are printed copies of it around. Um, Hey, Dave, things that I, Dave, yeah. can I interrupt you for one second? Yeah, sure. Every time you turn your head, we can't hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. So if you could just I'm face sorry. forward, because <laughs> what you're saying is important. We want to get it. Okay, good. I'm sorry about that. The dog is, sorry. you know, being a, big, being a gigantic baby here. Oh, so sure. anyway, the, the story, the, the story just, it, it sort of grew through the years. The search took a long time. Writing of it took a long time because you couldn't figure out how to approach this story because there's so many holes in the stories we used to say in the newspaper business. I filled a lot of the significant holes between search on, on just hundreds of reels of microfilm to just, you know, whatever I could scrape at. You know, there's some interesting things about this story that a lot of people are not aware of. I mean, the fact that, you know, he was 30 years old and died in 1927 was, you know, pretty significant. I think the reason he wound up in the Hall of Fame is because after, after he had a fist fight with Frankie Frisch in the dugout soon after he joined the Giants, he and Frisch became really good friends. And, and as you probably know, in, in the late 60s and early 70s, Frankie Frisch was the driving force behind the veterans being added to the Hall of Fame. And, and honestly, you know, I've had people tell me through the years, a few people tell me through the years that Ross Youngs doesn't belong in the Hall of Fame. He had, you know, his career wasn't long enough. His numbers aren't that great for a guy who played during the really lively ball era. But you look back, you start looking back, and people, now the other one's barking. You look back and there are people at that time, experts at that time saying, this guy is the best right fielder in baseball. And there was a guy playing in the same park up until 1923 named Babe Ruth. And, and. Where am I in your lap? How about two of them in here? Now they're wrestling with each other. Hey. Sounds like you're having a rough, rough time. Rough time. Rough, rough. Time. <laughs> he don't he don't want to do when he's in this half of the house because he can't come over here normally. Also was was, you know, for, I even had to find out how the guy died. You know, there was so little written about it. What basically happened was is that late in the 1924 season, he got strep throat. And this is before antibiotics. This is before a lot of medicine came along. And you just, you sort of got over it, right? Well, the problem is the infection spread to his kidneys. And uh, it began to affect him probably at the end of that season in 1925. And then 1926, he just was not, it was just a shell of his former self. And John McGraw, you know, McGraw, who used to have spies and detectives follow guys around. Well, McGraw had a nurse to travel with Ross in 1926 because that's the relationship they had. It's interesting to see this. And, and I look back at it and I think probably one of the reasons why, why Ross Youngs and John McGraw got along so well is that McGraw was really a father figure to him because Ross didn't really have a father when he was growing up. But he was, he was one of these guys that sort of, he paid attention. <laughs> All he needed was a dose of antibiotics, right? He, he was a guy who paid attention to, to coaching. When he got up there and McGraw told him what to do, he did it. Which, of course, McGraw appreciated because you know how McGraw was. He, he didn't broach anybody stepping up on anything. 
so it, it, you know and i think that it just that relationship to me was very significant to the whole story and the fact that you know the legend goes that mcgraw had two photos in his in his office at the polo grounds he had christy matthewson and ross youngs behind his desk and they talk about i actually found a confirmation of that because they found they found out when when mcgraw left the giants when he left the organization he um he took the pictures with him and someone noted that he picked up the two pictures and those were two of the few things that he took with him out of his office so you know i, I like that relationship it, you know it, it's interesting the relationship with frankie frisch because Fr he and frisch were very different i mean frisch was the as as the folks used to say back then a yankee Ross Youngs was the grandson of a guy who was a colonel in the Confederate Army. So very much a cultural difference there. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of interesting to look at that, that culture clash that happened because he also married a girl from New York, of which his mother did not approve. It wound up being a very ugly sort of parting in divorce. And never, the divorce never completely went through, but his mother basically cut off his wife and their daughter after he died. <laughs> I found all this in the research. I found the, the, the stories. And um, as I wrote, I, in fact, right after the book came out, I actually heard from his granddaughter who lives up in New York somewhere. I can't remember where it was that she lives, but she lives up in New York. And I heard from her. She says, I want to thank you for putting that part of the story in because that part of the story really never got told. You know, it was always, his wife was just sort of terrible to him and that kind of thing. But he was, honestly, he was a big mama's boy. And um, it, it, the, it just sort of poisoned the whole relationship. And so, you know, there's a lot of unfortunate things about the story. The fact that he died so young, the fact that the, the marriage was not happy, you know, it, 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 People, there's a review on Amazon that says, you know, it made it sound like I was pissed off about the whole thing because <laughs> I couldn't find enough information about him. And this, that the story was sort of kind of depressing. I said, you know, that's the way it goes. You know, you know, you, somebody was talking about Eddie Grant earlier, the book about Eddie Grant. You know, they put up memorials to Ross and to Eddie Grant on the wall, on the outfield wall at the polo grounds. And um, at the end of the book, the book ends basically because when the Giants left New York, that plaque came down off the wall and it was big and heavy. I saw a picture of it. That plaque has never been found. Hmm. Apparently someone has found the Eddie Grant one, but uh, the, the one to Ross has never been found. Hmm. You want you want to ask that? Okay. He's gonna eat now. Okay. So you know, I was sort of scatter shooting around here. If if anybody has any questions about anything, I'll be happy to, to sort of reach back into my memory and see what I can remember about this. It's been a while since the book came out. Uh, Gary did a great a detective job of finding me because for somebody who had work published online and in newspapers for years and years, I'm very hard to find. Because <laughs> all of that stuff that I did through all those years is behind firewalls somewhere. Hmm. So I appreciate I appreciate you. Talk to y'all a little bit about this and talk about the book a little bit. Hey Dave, I, I got a, I got yes, a couple, I got a couple of questions for you. Uh, yes, sir. We we know why there was an Eddie Grant plaque. Why was there a plaque for Ross Youngs? Well, uh, part of it was that they really felt like that they need they needed to memorialize somebody who had been that good of a player there for many years. And I think a lot of it had to do with McGraw because McGraw probably was a force behind that. They actually raised money for it with individual subscriptions. They wouldn't take more than a couple of dollars from any individual. And there's a story that Babe Ruth showed up at the Giants office during that winter and, and turned in his dollar. Wow. Is that so that's sort of the, is that plaque? I never saw the plaque. Is that uh, available if I go on Google to see that? It may be. I had a hard time finding it. There's a picture of it in the book. Okay. It's beautiful and it's big. And they, I saw a picture when they unveiled it, and it is, you know, big brass plaque with his image on it. It's, it's, um, it's pretty impressive, and it's in somebody's garage somewhere. Well, you know, you said about my detective work. Like I said before, you know, we hear about Carl Hubble and all these other guys and Mel Ott, 
And a lot of the Giants are, are you know, Hall of Famers, and this stuff needs to still be uh, explained and, and learned from us. So uh, that is the reason why I contacted you. So thanks again yeah. for coming on. Uh, my right. other question is, I, I you know, I, I looked at his, I looked at his statistics through, uh, uh, you know, Baseball Reference, and he, he had a career 322 average, I believe. And one year he actually had over 100 RBIs, which is, you know, for a guy with very little power, it was sort of like yeah. uh, a lot of us know Tommy Hurd. One year had 100 RBIs with like 11 home runs, but it was very very impressive statistics. It's interesting. It's interesting the way his statistics sort of went up and down and how they varied. Because there were years when McGraw had him hit leadoff because he's very fast, probably the fastest guy on the club. There were years where he hit cleanup. And I suspect that, you know, the years that he hit cleanup were the years that he had more RBIs. There were guys in front of him getting on base. Um, yeah, not a lot of big home run power, but nobody hit a lot of big home runs in, in, in polo grass, right? You know, all of his home runs, virtually all of his home runs were the legs kind of, of home runs, the exciting kind. Um, but I think a lot of the, the sort of variation in the, in the, in the statistics and in the different leadership things through the years had a lot to do with where McGraw hit him in the order. Because he hit leadoff, he hit cleanup, he hit third a couple of – it seems like a, there were a couple of seasons where he had him hitting third. So, And my last question is – you you call him a San Antonio baseball legend. Is is his remains in San Antonio? Yes, the, there is a cemetery, an old cemetery on the south side of town, where his actually they they took up a collection after he died to put a headstone on his grave, and it's pretty pretty nice. It's not real big. He's in the same cemetery as um, Rube Waddell, by the way. Oh. Um, Waddell's is even in an older section, but they made a nice, they bought a nice Memorial de Ross. There's always at least one baseball sitting there at the headstone. And, and the book is, the book is still available on Amazon, correct? Yes, still available on Amazon. And also if you go to the, if you look for the history press, it's actually the history press has been bought up by another uh, publication publisher, but you can still search for it on history press as well. Thanks, Dave. Mars, you're up. Unmute. I wasn't sure if um, if Texas was in the Confederacy. I yeah. thought it was uh, yeah. it was a territory during the Civil War. Southern no, it was. It became a state and it became its own country, and then it was annexed by the United States in 1845. So no. was it a conf union or confederacy? Yes. No, it was a confederate, confederate state. state. Yep. Okay. Well, the main question I have, wasn't Ross Young, didn't Ross Young also play the infield? He actually was a second baseman when the Giants discovered him. They had a scout, a great scout down in this part of the world, and he was a second baseman. And he actually played second base all through the minors. And when the Giants discovered him and signed him and sent him to Rochester, the year before he made his big league debut, or the year he made his debut, the season that he played in Rochester, he played second base. But McGraw had told them that this guy needed to learn how to play the outfield because he was too aggressive and, and his hands were, were not really, really great for a second baseman. But he was really fast. He was able to play he played that right field wall at the polo ground. Somebody said, like, he majored in billiards. Wow, and all this time I thought Rochester worked for Jack Benny. <laughs> they loved him in Rochester. I found some newspaper clips from when he played in Rochester, New York. And they, they just absolutely loved him. And yeah, I get Rochester. Thank, thank you, Dave. I'm not, I'm not that young. I, I got it before I call on Jim Weber. Jim Mully. Jim, are there any mark? Are there any markers in Rochester for uh, Ross Youngs or anything? Not that I'm aware of. I was just getting up to look at some of my old Rochester Red Wing history books to see if I can find anything on him. But uh, no, I was not aware of him. I, 1917. 1917, he played here. Yeah, he led the. He ac he actually was second in the league in hitting. To to, out for the life of me, I can't remember who it was. It was a guy who had been in the big leagues who played with with another team in the league that year, and he led the league, and Ross was second in hitting in the league. 
Wow. I will look at look into that. You know who would know that, by the way, Gary, Scott Petoniak, who you had speak to us a while right, back. Right, right, right. He's, he's done a lot of history work on the Red Wings. Uh, he would know that. But uh, I'm going to look into it now. 1917. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. Because it's basically he his season finished at Rochester and they called it up to the Giants. We were never a farm team of the Giants, though. No, it, it was very, it was a very informal sort of relationship. Yeah. Formal relationship with the Giants as well, because they trained down here. Well, that's but really the, interesting. Yeah, I believe so, it's seventeen. You, you so might look at. Go ahead. It, we were in the international league, and we still yep. are. Um, so there wouldn't have been an affiliate. Our affiliation for years was with the St. Louis Cardinals and the Baltimore Orioles. So that yeah. th these teams would have been unaffiliated at that time then, and then yeah, everybody yeah. could have grabbed them. Around the war, around World War One, that most of the teams were still sort of unaffiliated, or they had very loose relationships. Mm -hmm. Like like the Giants, like I said, the Giants. Like, hey, San Antonio McGraw loves San Antonio, and. Um, they um they had just a loose relationship, and there were guys who the, the Giants would send to San Antonio to play a season down here. In yeah. fact, it's a funny story. The last guy to hit 400 in the Texas League had been sent here by the Giants. Interesting. I, well, I'm going to go check that out, and I'll, I'm going to call Scott Petoniak, too. We'll find out with, if we had any connection. <laughs> you I may have to crank that. up some of those microfilm reels to find it. <laughs> we might have to. Okay, thank you. Jim, keep me now, posted, Judge. Uh, Jim Weber, you're up. Yeah, David, beyond the Hall of Fame, where did you go to get this information? Because he seems like he was a well, besides dying early, he was a well-buried Hall of Famer. I, I'd never heard of yeah. him before. Where'd you go? Um, to get all this? I, I did a lot of research on microfilm. I went through and I looked through every year of his career in the New York Times on microfilm, which fortunately they had at a university here. I looked through the microfilm of the three newspapers in San Antonio at the time. Uh, there was a scrapbook at the Hall of Fame. It was one of the few things that survived. His mother had several scrapbooks at her house in San Antonio, and they were destroyed in a flood in the 20s. So I, I, I found some pieces of the scrapbook. I found lots and lots in the newspaper archives, in the microfilm of the newspapers. I found some other clippings. Uh, the only real big story that was written about him after he joined the Hall of Fame was a guy from the Dallas Morning News who wrote a column about him. About his daughter. What, what ultimately did he die of? Was it the kidney problem because of that yeah, early yeah, disease? They, they called it, they, they, at the time, they called it Bright's disease, which is just sort of a, kidney, uh, a catch all for a kidney infection. Okay. And he basically died of a kidney, a kidney failure. Thank you. A rather, a rather unpleasant way to go. Bill Clank, you're up. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to this because, like so many of us, you know, I thought I knew the Giants, and uh, my goodness, this is a guy that I had heard of but knew nothing about. Before I uh, address two short questions to you, Dan Taylor, I, I am passing on your uh, address and email. To a guy I met today at one of uh, uh, Steve's uh, sessions that he puts on, a guy by the name of Marvin Block is going to get in touch with you, an enormous Hollywood Stars fan. Oh, good. I thought it was an IRS rep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's 86,000 of them out there. Nice. This guy is not. No, as far as I know, Marvin did not work for the IRS or does. Uh, Post he's office. He's now. Uh, but he's a good guy, and, and I think he's going to buy one of your books. You'll notice that today I've got a beer. I drink non-alcoholic beer, and I, I, brought, I did that for a certain reason. I believe that Ross Young is the only uh, player in the, uh, in the Hall of Fame who was born in a city named after a beer. Shiner beer. <laughs> Shiner, Texas. Here's the Shiner, Texas, and the Shiner beer. It is a good Texas beer. Uh, and you guys have a number of them down there, but uh, uh, that that that's fun. Hey, the other thing that came from one of the sessions I sat in on today with uh, with Steve uh, on Aaron Judge, they one of the participants, one of their questioners, 
Um, they raised the questions of assist by outfielders and suggested that where an outfielder had an enormous, enormous, enormously large number of assists or a fair number of assists, theirs, they weren't that good an outfielder. I, I will not uh, quibble with his offensive uh, stats, but this guy in 10 years managed to rack up 203 assists and 117 errors as an outfielder uh, and ended up with only a 950 uh, percentage for fielding. Maybe you could shed some light on, you know, what it was about his fielding that lended themselves to those kind of statistics. Well, that that's the reason he wasn't a second baseman. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, well, good I, answer. That's a good comeback. I think, I think, I think part of it is not, you know, not to be too up about it, but part of it, part of it is also that um, he was very aggressive. He was very oh. aggressive. Tried to get to every ball. You know, I, the scores back then, I imagine were the scores were pretty tough. But he, he made an effort to get to every possible ball that he could okay. and try to make a play on every ball that he could. But I think part of it also is that he really didn't get any good coaching, especially as an outfielder, really until he got to the big leagues. Okay. You know, like I said, he was supposed to have played the outfield at Rochester, and he actually wound up uh, playing second base most of the year at Rochester. So that's – I think that's that's some of it. I think just the fact that you know, I think McGraw probably worked with him pretty extensively on making him a, a better outfielder. But I think that that natural aggressiveness was just something that that he never could quite get out of him, trying to make every play and get to every ball. Well, if McGraw and Frisch vouch for him, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah, McGraw. I'm sure if McGraw had been had been you know on the Veterans Committee. Along with Frankie Frisch, he'd he'd have made it. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Hey guys. <laughs> Bill, you're up I next. Think, Bill, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, Dave, I want I I had this thought when you mentioned that uh, McGraw had two photographs in his office, with Matthewson and Young, and I'm wondering if uh, if one of the reasons why is they both died young. Matthewson died in 25 and the Youngs died in 27 and they both played for the Giants. Yeah. If that might have been part of it, that the two that, players. That was part of it. The, the fact, and the fact that McGraw, I mean, was very fond of, of Matty too. Right. You know, he was one of McGraw's favorites you know, for a long time and Ross for, you know, for a less time, nine years, probably more or less nine years. And I, I think it's just those were his two favorites. They were guys that he had found to be very coachable. You know, he liked their personalities. I don't think Ross, you know, had a big personality. I think he was a guy that was much, very much a team player, a guy who listened to the manager, did what the manager said. I'm sure I think Maddie a lot in a lot of ways was the same way. Thank you. Yep. Ed Freer, you're up. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much again. Again, you're showing us a little more inside baseball information that I did not know. But most of us uh, that remember the Giants here in New York are familiar with the Fordham Flash, Frankie Fish, who used to do the TV broadcast before the game. And can you tell me some more about the interactions between, uh, between him and Frank and maybe some of the machinations or whatever the dealings are that Frankie worked to get candidates into the Hall of Fame? Yeah, you know, like I said, I think he, there were stories about he and Frisch having a fist fight in the dugout when, when they both sort of wound up with the Giants together. They were very different personalities. Frisch is a big personality. You know, you, if you saw him on TV, if you or heard about his next play, he was a big personality. Ross was not a big personality, but he was a guy who didn't put up with fools either. So they, um, they formed sort of a friendship because they were so different. You know, I think, I think Ross on the Giants at that time were Frisch and High Pockets Kelly, first baseman, first baseman, most of those clubs. And, uh, you know, there's there's legends about how Frisch sort of railroaded people into the Hall of Fame when he was on the Veterans Committee. And, and you know, I, don't, I haven't looked into a lot of that. I don't really, I'm not into that kind of research anymore. But, you know, honestly, 
I think the fact that, that he vouched for a guy who he played with, who he felt, many others felt, was the best right fielder in the National League at the time, I think, you know, that it's a very valid addition to the Hall of Fame from Frisch. So we vote for him, too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? It's a uh, very thought-provoking topic tonight because, again, it's somebody that we – don't really know much about. Anybody have any comments? Or, or well, questions? I was wondering if I was wondering if Dave inherited uh, his dog White fighting from Soupy Sales. No. <laughs> <laughs> I love these references, by the way. Most of the people at my office are much younger than I am, and I can't throw out any of these kinds of references because they just go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dave, Dave, I have a question for you. Um, in the, in doing your research on on Ross Young's, what was the so, the most valuable source you found on information about him? Well, you know, the scrapbooks that his mother had collected that survived, that they actually donated to the Hall of Fame, were written, were invaluable in some ways because they were very much archived, or they were very much they were. Um, I hate, I don't know what the term, I'm trying to think of what the term is it's on the tip of my tongue. There were things that were very special to his mother about him. That's how I found out about Rochester, were clips that he had mailed her from the Rochester newspaper. Those scrapbooks were a great starting place, and I actually looked at them at the Hall of Fame, which kind of gave me a little chills because it was just, they brought out this, this beautiful old, you know, 70 something year old scrapbook that, that had been his and his mother had been compiled and it sort of gave me the chills a little bit to be researching that had my white gloves on there at the hall of fame um but you know just reeling through the microfilm you know you find things you occasionally you'll find something you'll come across i read some books as well i mean there are books about mcgraw there's books about giants in that era but I really think the scrapbooks were the things that provided the most insight. I just had to fill in around them. Right. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Dave, uh, it has, was his family in contact with you and were, I yeah. guess, must have been thrilled that somebody uh, recognized their relative. Yeah. His, his nephew, who's also named Ross Youngs, uh, lived in San Antonio for many years. And I, I've visited with him several times. He had he didn't have a lot of information, didn't have a lot of memorabilia, because it had been his his father was Ross's older brother, and uh, he he was born after Ross had died. But we had some nice visits. Then I've also emailed him. I got an email with his granddaughter who lives up there in New York. Uh, I actually have emailed with some of the other uh, nephews and and you know children of nephews. They were pretty happy to see something had been sort of come out that had come out about him because they sort of felt the way y'all did that he really was somebody who had been overlooked for many years. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Mr. Bouchard, you're up. Hey, hey thanks. Hey, thank you, Dave, for uh, the presentation. Um, I just mentioned that the Sabre biography, uh, Sabre Bio Project biography of Ross Young's relies heavily on um, your book. Looks like a pretty, it. yeah. It looks like a pretty good um, the, biography. The, as well. the, the fellow that wrote it, he actually contacted me for some information. Oh, <laughs> and your book came out in 2013, is that right? Right. And have you thought about updating it based on going to newspapers.com, genealogybank.com, all the resources that are out there now? That weren't there probably you know, when I, we were doing the research. I thought, about, I thought about it, but the publisher sold so few copies, I don't think they want to do a second edition. Right. You know, I there are a lot more resources out there. In fact, I'm working on another project now about my uh, my my great grandfather, and I found enormous amounts of, right. of information on those sites, on those newspaper archives online. Yeah, and the ten years since you wrote the book, and apparently you worked on it the previous ten. Right. I mean, that's a 20 year yeah. period. There's a lot more out there. Yeah, there's a, I'm sure there's a lot more out there. I've, you know, I come across things occasionally. I think, you know, that would have been good in the book. And, and, 
one of the relatives contacted me, had some memorabilia and some photos that I had never seen. But, you know, I, because the book was published by a publishing house, it's a little difficult to come up with a second edition of something that really didn't sell all that much. Yeah. Thank you. What are you working on now, Dave? Hey, uh, I, it's another thing I've been working on for years and years. Um, my great grandfather uh, escaped one step ahead of the British police from Northern Ireland in 1868. Came to this country, came to New York, came through Castle Garden, the, the predecessor to Ellis Island, and uh, wound up in all places East Texas, which is not territory that you would typically find an Irish Catholic in the, in the 19th century. But he learned how to do things. He was very, uh, somebody who was very adept mechanically. He built a huge business for, in his area with a sawmill, a grist mill. He had a commissary, built this huge house. He, you know, had all his, had a place for his workers to live if they wanted to live there. And my great aunt wrote a book about the family wanted to sort of fill in the blanks in her book. She wrote it in like the late 60s. And I sort of filled in a lot of the blanks in her book. And it's just something that I will self-publish. And, you know, it'll be on it'll be on Amazon. Um, you know, if people want to download it um, sometime early next year. Thank you. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Maury Bouchard will be joining us in early 2023 talking about Herman Franks. So just uh, that'll be another interesting topic. Hindi List, you're up. Hindi, unmute. Do you have any photographs of him that you can show us? Uh, the, the, the best picture that I have actually is on the cover of the book. Could you show us that? This is... This is my this is my favorite picture of him, and I'm glad they decided to put it on the cover. This is probably from 20, I want to say 20, probably 22, during the 1922 season. He's and then cute. on the back of the book, He's on the cute. back of the book here, is um, this actually where it is? They're right there. That actually is a proof of a baseball card in a series that never that never got uh, never got printed. The Ross Young's card never got printed. I bought the original on eBay many years ago. And there's some other pictures throughout the book that I found in various places. Um, most of them, you know, I bought on eBay. This is before there were a lot of pictures online. So, you know, that's that's, that's sort of that's sort of the story of the artwork in in the book. Thank you, yep. Mr. Coleman. You're up, and then Jim Mully. Norm, you're up. Okay, uh, David, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I happened to attend 50 years ago the Ross Young's induction ceremony at the Hall of Fame. Yeah. And, um, the other people inducted were Yogi Berra, Sandy Koufax, <laughs> Early Wynn, Lefty Gomez, Josh Gibson, Buck Leonard, and Will Harridge. I mean, it was quite an induction ceremony. It was a huge, a huge event. And um, I, I'm just curious if you could tell us maybe one or two of your favorite Ross Young stories. I have a really good one that I was thinking about on my drive home tonight. I, feel like I have about an hour commute each way to work, and I do a lot of thinking when I'm driving to avoid the idiots and pickup trucks in South Texas. And one of my favorite stories is actually was a Damon Runyon column that I came across. And he Ross was a scratch golfer. He was a great golfer. He, in another era, he'd have been a professional golfer. He and Bunyan were playing golf one day, and Ross was in a slump. He just wasn't hitting anything. He told Bunyan when they were playing golf, you know, I'm just going to I'm just gonna close my eyes. Next time I golf, I'm just going to close my eyes and just swing. And not think about it, sort of like the golf swing. You know, just take it pretty easy, pretty loosey goosey. And so the next day, they're at, the, they're at the polo grounds and Runyon's in the press box. And Ross gets up there and basically he just swings at the first thing he sees and it's, it's a single. And he looked up, he got to first base and he looked up and he pointed at Runyon in the press box and said, I told you that's what, how it's going to work. <laughs> and Runyon put this in a column. He wrote the whole thing in a column and it was really, really entertaining. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, that, you know, it, there's funny 
stories. He um he was a ball boy for the local minor league team when he was a teenager. He'd go out, he'd chase shag balls, um, collect seat cushions, collect bottles after games, that kind of thing. And at the end of one season, he was 16 years old. And the manager of this club says, we're going to give you a uniform and let you play. And uh, so they, he was 16 years old, no real experience, you know, certainly not in professional baseball. They send him out there, he plays second base. The first ball is hit right at him and it knocks him right on his butt. <laughs> And he gets up, and I think he probably threw it in the dugout, you know, in such a hurry. But, you know, that, that fact that he played one game for the San Antonio Minor League Club in the Texas League sort of came back to haunt him a little bit because there was some controversy about some high school sports after that. And they didn't pay him. He was just a kid. They said, let's give him a uniform and see what he can do. And, you know, like I said, the first ball hit to him, knocked him right on his butt. That's a good story. Thank you. And hey, the Norm, Giants train there, too? There were in several years the Giants actually trained in San Antonio because there was, at the time there was a very popular hot springs in San Antonio. McGraw was a big believer in, in, the, in the value of hot springs and, and hot spring soaks for players, especially in spring training early in the season. So they trained in San Antonio for several years. And in fact, there was a pretty good tradition of clubs training down here up until, I would say, probably the Depression which cut back on a lot of the travel, a lot of that kind of thing. And then mm -hmm. after that, I mean, it just sort of became a Florida thing. It was warmer. The weather here is very iffy in March. <laughs> you know, it can be beautiful one day, and the next day it's about 42 degrees and windy and wet. So that's the reason that spring training never really has come back to Texas. You know, Dave, he also uh, Dave Norm mentioned that he was at the induction. Um, yeah. I have uh, – Young's Hall of Fame plaque. Do you mind if I share that with the group? Sure, sure. All right. So, by the way, you can get the whole giant franchise collection of Hall of Famers by contacting the Hall of Fame. They're postcards. They look like this. They're really cool. Pick yeah, I've postcard. got that one. <laughs> yeah, so I'll read this to you. It says, uh, Ross Middlebrook Young's, nicknamed Pep, P-E-P. -E New York National League, 19, 1926. Star right fielder of champion Giants of 1921, 22, 23, 24. When he batted 327, 331, 336, and 356. Compiled lifetime average of 322, topping 309 of 10 seasons. Twice made 200 or more hits in a season. Led the league in doubles in 1919 and runs scored in 1923. Led National League outfielders in assists twice and tied once. Wow. Why, why is the nickname Pep, Dave? Uh, early on, the first training camp that he went to for the Giants, the year, the year that he wound up in Rochester, the, the story is that McGraw was sitting there watching these guys sort of work out, limber up and everything. And he looks out there and he says, that kid there, that little kid there, and Ross is not very big. That kid there, he's got a lot of pep. And that's how it stuck. I think McGraw probably gave him that nickname. Thank you. Wow. Um, uh, so Jim, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Judge, you're up. That's quite all right. Thanks, Gary. I just want to tell you, David, you really piqued my interest. I'm, I'm, in, front, I'm in Rochester and you know, we the locals here always kind of think of the our Red Wing team is with is with their affiliation with the St. Louis Cardinals and then later with the Baltimore Orioles. That's kind of the history there. And but it, I'm looking now. It started in 1899, and it says here uh, Rochester with, is the oldest continuously operating sports franchise in North America below the major league level. And we were, the, I guess, the Rochester Hustlers at, at that time. <laughs> yeah. When he played here, and I would, yeah. I don't think I've ever heard the Roch of the Rochester Hustlers. So now I got to go do a little research yeah. on what happened here between 1899 and 19 uh, 1929 when the Cardinals came in. But uh, I, yeah. I'm also going to check with the, the Red Wings to see if they do have anything honoring Youngs. So I'm, I'm they probably sure. never have because it was a well, long time ago. Yeah, but we have a Hall of Fame, and we got plaques of you know all the old Cardinals and, and Orioles. Who yeah. Played there. And if we don't have something, I think we ought to we ought to put something up. So I, that's my yeah, project. Honestly, for the summer. 
By the way, by the way, I would like to come and see that because my son and his wife and my first grandchild live in Rochester too. Ah, very good. We'll, we'll, uh, get, I may, that, we'll get, get that there. done. I'm on it. I'm on it. Uh, All right. You get Thank you. schedule Thank it for you. next summer because I, I like to get out of South Texas during the summer. Yeah, <laughs> you wouldn't like it here in January, February too much. So we'll do no, it in the summer. No, I, it's brisk. Yeah, hey, Jim, <laughs> Jim, that is an article for Scott, by the way. You got to work on it. Yeah. No, well, Scott will definitely do it. Yeah, I'll talk to him. <laughs> Hey, okay, Gary, the stats you quoted for Ross Young's, yes. are those World Series batting averages from 21 to 24? Or no, those, those, season were, those, averages? Were, those were the season ending averages. Well, those, those are quite good. <laughs> well, that's why he's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. 322 lifetime yeah. average is, is very, very Excellent. impressive. Well, Anybody how did you else? Do in the World Series I'm from sorry? The, in those four years? Well, the, you know, I don't, I don't have those stats. The plaques just state, you know, what they state. They well, we can look it up. You, we you can, can look, look it up. It up. Uh, really good, really good. 21 and 22. 23 was okay. 24, he was pretty sick and really didn't hit that well in the 24 oh. World Series. Anybody else with well, a comment or a question? There you go. All right. All right. Dave, listen. Uh, I know you probably haven't spoke to a group in a while, so this is a great thing that we, you know, heard about him. And uh, can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. All right. And please uh, come back, okay? Yeah. Just even as uh, even as somebody is in the group, just hearing somebody else speak. All right, guys, let's give it up, guys and gals. To Dave. Oh, that was great, Dave. Thank very thank you, Dave. Thank you. And again, thank you very Dave, much. Thank Dave, you, Dave. I, I spoke thank to Dave, Dave, and Dave said. You know, and he, he's very frank with you. He said he wrote the book out of passion and research. He didn't sell much, so there's plenty <laughs> of, of books available on Amazon. Plenty of copies available out there. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm right, guys. Have a great night, and uh, we will see you uh, next week with Steve Kahn. I'm going to hang out here uh, if anybody wants to chat. Dave, thanks again. Thanks a lot, y'all. Appreciate it. Great Have job. Be well. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.